episode 15 design company podcast my brother how are you doing very well the sun's finally out again here in france life is good the sun is coming cannot complain let's yourself? talk yes i'm doing well i'm actually been i've been hitting the bottle a little bit and it's a okay. bottle of uh, vitamin c with a touch of elderflower juice uh elderflower cordial ho homemade okay. uh, pretty hard to say that actually there's a good technique for vitamin C that I like to call uh, cutting up lemons and pouring them into a glass. It works pretty well. Yeah, yeah, true, true that actually. And this, this actually elderflower cordial has got loads of lemon in it. So I've got like going double vitamin C and then elderflower just for the touch of that kind of divine presence. Well, if, <laughs> if I had to bridge elegantly into today's topic, I would say, you know, when life gives you lemons, use your leadership to make them into fizzy water. Yeah, and for me also to make a segue, I've been leading myself in a slightly different way physically, for example. I've, mm. I've taken a lead on that front in terms of streamlining my body because during the lockdown, I put a bit of weight, not like masses, but mm. a bit enough to, to kind of make me feel like I'm a, you know, the fattest guy ever, basically, that I've been. And so now I started running, <laughs> but like sprinting in the garden. I did 10 sprints up and down and it literally killed me. Uh, but it's, you know, wake up call to, to become more active in that kind of cardiovascular way. Um, and also then it's, you know, reflecting on everyone else in the family, society and so on. So <laughs> Makes sense. So in terms of that, then, I mean, leading yourself to a better future, I believe that is what leadership's all about, right? So without further ado, Jason, my brother, in a very philosophical <laughs> operational sense, what is the purpose of leadership? In my view, purpose of leadership is to take oneself and everyone else forward into the next best incarnation of existence, incarnation of life, next mm. best life experience. And that ought to be holistic in approach. So not to just take people along, but also systems, innovation, products, money, and growth. Uh, and I, th I think we had, we have, and certainly have had lots of leaders who have taken a focused view on one of these areas and excelled at it, you know, made loads of money, but it hasn't been purposeful or created great systems and it hasn't worked as a product and so on. Uh, but doing it across all seven areas is where real leadership resides. <laughs> so this is one of, the, one of the things I like about our conversations. It's that every time we're proving whether the design company model works in a universal sense or not. And so I had never thought about it until now, uh, but it is true that if you are thinking about leadership, then, you want to be thinking about your leadership across all these seven areas, not just having happy people, but actually effective systems, good products, uh, increasing amounts of money, right? Um, I'm not going to diverge too much from your vision of leadership because I like the way you put it, right? It's basically about bringing people into, an, into a better future. Correct. And all the other stuff that goes with them, right? So for me, I just very much want to dive into the people aspects of leadership because it actually ties in nice well with systems as well. So, you know, there's a big expression that we see, which is being your own boss. As I think this is a very dangerous expression, right? Because ultimately what we want is we want people as individuals, whatever their role, to have as much agency for themselves as they wish. So whether you're the CEO or not, what we want to create is an environment where you have as much leadership and self-initiative as possible over your own life. And so for me, the role as a leader is to find people who already have a sense of purpose, whose purpose can be aligned with my company in different ways, but really that is the purpose coming from them, and then work together in a way that we're moving forward the, the company objectives, but also that I am kind of freeing them up to express what is in themselves. And so for me, like leadership is just kind of setting that long-term vision and then putting in understanding what, you, what really drives the people that you work with as well as your goals and then putting into place all the resources and everything around them so they can succeed. And really that's very important to keep in mind is that usually we see the leader as kind of like the king or the boss or the person that must be served. But I actually have an opposite relationship, which is that 
my job as leader is really to understand what are my people's goals as they've been set by them or I, and then what are the resources and support I need to give them to be successful. Correct. And uh, there, there are different, obviously, different types of leadership as well. And uh, it, it seems that companies are, well, in some sense, rapidly moving towards a lot more distributed leadership that's necessary that once employees individually are in different locations and they are not immediately visible to the next uh, door manager mm. uh, th the manager is having to relinquish some of the direct command and control in and entrust it literally into the individual employee and perhaps be able to manage that through a system which leads us nicely to the systems where the system acts as an aid towards managing people mm -hmm. and towards continuously gathering that intel and insights into what is it that people really need so that the collaborative and cohesive collaboration, there's the three C's we, as managers, we love those kind of collaborative, <laughs> cohesive collaboration. Uh, can thrive in a way that doesn't have to be sat there on some sort of throne and kind of like, hmm, let me see what I can do in order to manage these people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like there's no need for that kind of uh, approach, which, you know, it, it's, it's kind of sounds funny when I kind of act it out that way. But what seems to have happened over, over, let's say last two decades. Whereas when I first started working, there was literally this kind of the manager feels like they own you and they kind of mm. speak down at you, like almost with a finger pointing yeah. to that exact same mentality being expressed, but in a lot more diplomatic wording, right? Whereas basically they're just looking to manipulate you to do what they tell you without telling you directly. But the same approach is being exercised instead and, of actually harnessing the thinking of the co you know community basically yeah, within yeah. the company yeah i mean I, I love what you're saying right because what you're saying is essentially where even with all this stuff we're talking about wellness uh, you know happiness of the employees basically it's the same old archetypes of infantilization of a whole working population that are just being done through more manipulative and indirect means right and so for me, essentially, as long as there, will, as there is always this undertone of, well, I am your superior, because if you look at the actual managerial words, when we're talking about hierarchies, at least that's what we talk, that's the word we use in France, in France, your superior, things aren't going to change. So for me, good leadership, and we're talking about the systems, is about first setting aside the fact that your role does not place you above any one individual human being. Like, I don't care if you're the CEO of a company that's worth 50 million and you've got an intern coming in. You are both human beings and you have to yep. always keep that humility in mind. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that as CEO, well, you have more decision-making power, influence, ability to mobilize resources, but this is a responsibility and something you need to be a steward of and not something that is just your God-given right for you to wield as you choose, right? And yeah. Some, someone recently said, like, when you're in a boardroom or something like that, you want to be the dumbest person in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, why was that? Uh, because you, that means you, you're basically working with smarter people than yourself and you're able mm. to, one, learn, second, you know, you, you would somehow manage to get in there as a person who is, you know, knows less, is perhaps capable uh, less capable, but are still there riffing with them. So there, there is, a, I mean, it's still a sort of comparative there. Uh, and I think a lot of this kind of motivational speak, you know, which I, I think you can even find a lot now on LinkedIn. You know, there's that kind of like, I will, I'm my own boss, or you want to be the dumbest person in the, in the boardroom. It, it's really more about like, for me, I'm thinking about tapping into the best aspects of everyone and then putting that together like a puzzle so that it works as a clockwork. Mm. Uh, that's really what it's about. Like no one's really kind of the dumbest or the smartest. That's, that's a sort of like odd way to look at it really.
Well, w w one thing, you know, that I've learned over time is that you think actually that you're either intelligent or not intelligent, but what you actually learn when you start looking at yourself and fresh mind is great for this, but why the world is that there's multiple forms of intelligence, mm -hmm. right? And so if you are a leader and I'm talking about a leader of a company like a CEO, you know, like myself, your job is yes, you need to be intelligent to be able to converse with people. But what you really need to figure out is what are the unique forms of intelligence that each of your team member possesses? Mm -hmm. And how can you let them take the lead in that area um, in a way that they can you know, innovate, deliver new things while still being in line with the company goals? So, for example, uh, I recently hired like a, a go-to-market team for Anya uh, in a country. We have our country manager there. And so he's got a lot of sales experience, um, a lot of things. So he's taking his unique knowledge of local market of how things work to help us sell Anya into that country. And on my end, I'm making sure he has the resources, the materials, the collateral, the training to succeed. But the whole point is, it's not, oh, I am the European headquarters and you are just the idiot uh, in country. It's really understanding that we're a, a team and that, you know, I'm bringing the technology operations support, but he is bringing that on the ground look. And so understanding that it's just different pieces fitting together in a greater collective rather than one that's above and one that's below is necessary. And I'm not saying you don't need hierarchy. Like, for example, he has, you know, he'll have authority over his colleagues in that country. But even his colleagues in the decision-making process will be invited to disagree with him, to take the lead in areas where they are better than him. So it's this kind of thing where you have people who are clearly making decisions, but you're also enabling individuals to become leaders in their own respective areas, whether that's a small area or a much larger area. Yeah, and so what in, in this particular model here, you can treat each one of these seven areas as a form of intelligence because mm. some people are a lot more kind of good at purpose and strategy and so on and kind of setting out the big vision and the kind of uh, principles and so on mm. some other people are good at money both making driving optimizing and so on some other people are growth you know externally focused let's get let's get new customers let's get people engaged thinking feedback all that kind of stuff and so you can actually even you know, uh, assess people for their kind of core qualities and, and gifts across these seven areas and then put them into the right uh, roles, basically, mm. where they can excel at what they're naturally gifted at or what they've basically uh, committed to, you know, to be, to be good at. And in that case, you could be, the dumbest person with regards to growth and money. But if you're working with the smartest person in that area and they're filling up on you while you're good at systems and innovation, then you will con um, contribute to each other's dumb and smart bits yeah. and complete each other and complete the puzzle of the company. And then everything works for everyone because this is a system that feeds in itself and, um, and the, the, the growth and money person will be helping the systems innovation person and vice versa. That's the idea. Exactly. So in that respect, <laughs> when you're talking about complementarity, so what is the product of good leadership? What does actually produce? What does that look like? I think the product of good leadership is cohesive family-like atmosphere within the company and when i say family like i don't mean this kind of the dysfunctional family where you know <laughs> people are quarreling all about all the time I'm, I'm talking more about family where you know people are again helping each other to mm. achieve the purpose together without anyone kind of telling each other what to do it's mm. more like uh, most of the time uh, when, whenever I've started, I was like one of the earliest students of Agile and in Agile, really a lot of this kind of ethos is, is baked into what is, what would be a, a pure Agile thing, mm -hmm. uh, where I think it's Ken Schweber, who originally was one of the uh, authors of Agile Manifesto, who said, you know, Agile, some people say Agile only works with smart people who are proactive, good, co uh, good communicators, willing to do their work, show up frequently, 
and uh, you know actually do quality work. And he goes, that's not true. You know, agile works with complete monkeys who don't communicate, who are totally stupid, not willing to work, never show up and, you know, don't care about quality. And in that case, agile always consistently produces crap, <laughs> you know, and it's good to know that upfront early on. Why? Because then you can know either who to change in terms of people or swap them around mm. or how to change the system and so on to actually make the thing work. So in many respects, the design company is extremely agile company where everyone is a worthwhile building block, but for leaders is to find out who can contribute in the best way. And with the design company software, that is possible to do not just one soft upfront, but to redo that on daily basis or frequently as you want and reshuffle people around to give them opportunity, maybe to some of, some of the growth people to contribute to innovation. In fact, via the software, they can do that anyway. Even if the person is working in the growth, they'll still contribute to the innovation. So the software is acting like a bridge that is both like, bridge between the consciousness and cognition of different people within the company, but also between the ideas and functional areas. Whereas a, per a person can work and be committed to growth as their core focus, but via the software, they can contribute to all the other seven areas, which is the balancing act, uh, which with so many clients that I worked with, I've ended up finding that, that they were working in so many silos, even in a relatively small company, let's say 20 people. It's amazing how much there is a silo between the, the, the systems people don't tell the marketing what to do and vice versa, because what do they know about this and what do they know about this? It's like a hardcore split and that's really bad leadership because you actually but what, what happens is the systems people, when they're working on systems, they get emotionally tied into that. It's their like, it's my precious, my mm. precious. And then the growth people, the marketing people, they develop all this messaging and so on. They're going like, my precious, it's so special. But they're also emotionally involved in that. But when you get people with a sort of just, you know, objective perspective, external perspective, they feed back, you actually getting real feedback and that's possible within the company without need for anyone to get um, uh, upset about it in fact it's possible to leverage it so that everyone gets progressive and you know benefit from it practically makes sense and i love what you said about you know someone working in one area and being in another actually for example that's why we're not going to hire a cto at Anya. so we'll have a cio we'll have ep engineering we'll have like the whole technology software team but for me, the message I want to send is that <clears throat> technology is not a separate department. Technology should be in sales. Technology should be in marketing. Technology should be in all the other departments. And it's up to the people working in these areas of the company to also proactively work with the engineering resources to say, well, what are the systems and tools and things you can put into place to support our work? Yeah, and... and what then happens is that as because this is what most companies don't really take on board almost at all more people you employ at the company more eyes ears mouths you have that can observe listen speak back add opinion and so on that's an incredible value and resource and once that's utilized through something like design company software, what that starts doing is that it starts exponentially feeding on itself as other people start seeing. Because sometimes this is always hap happens in, in uh, design, uh, design thinking sessions where you're having an ideation with people. Uh, you, you kind of throw up an idea up there, let's ideate about a new app you know, the banking up or whatever. And someone says, how about we get children to manage our money? Cause they seem to be better than these postmodern bankers. Right. And then it's like, everyone laughs away and it's like, ha 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 ha. What a silly idea. And then it's like, 
hold on a second. How about we make an app that even a child can use, right? Mm. It's like suddenly now that's starting to be like a really good idea from something that sounded like a silly thing at the beginning. Suddenly mm. it's becoming like, hey, our product has to be so simple that a six-year-old can use it. Yeah. And actually, and it's like, I, yeah. I, I love what you just said as well, because I think that's one of the big things to, to look at. Just coming back to the innovation side before we talk about money and growth is that in a company, leadership is also about taking decisions, but, but also that's the, let me, let me rephrase. You have two modes of thinking, right? You have divergent thinking and convergent thinking. So divergence is when you're considering the realm of possibilities and convergence is when you're really narrowing down your options and, you know, rubber stamping a final choice, which is often what we interpret as leadership or decision-making power, which is giving that final approval. But actually in leadership, there's a huge amount in the divergent part of creating the right ideas and options, which we're then going to decide upon. And so this iterative process you mentioned, going from a terrible idea to a good idea, that's actually what I implement within Anya, right? So the kind of culture I've created is one where, you know, where we have a group of people about around whatever topic. And okay, we'll just like start throwing out ideas and maybe some are good, some are bad. But the whole point is, instead of each person throwing in their own idea, each person tries to build on top of the ideas that the other people have already provided, taking them further. So yes, you might also provide a new idea if it's a really good one. But instead of having a competition of ideas, everybody's either proposing new options or building on existing options. And we're gradually refining that and then seeing what makes sense. And then there's someone, either me or someone else, if it's, that's their role, who will take the final decision. But through a good process, we've managed to include everyone in actually, you know, the, you know in actually creating a beautiful realm of possibilities that makes sense. Exactly. And what, what you find is very, very common anti-pattern in quote unquote leadership, which is actually should really be labeled as misleadership is, is that somebody, uh, somebody, you, somebody, one person has a kind of usually like an emotional event happen in their life. Uh -huh. And then they go like, because of this emotional event, I'm going to commit myself to building a business around it. Right. And, and it's like, you realize they're extremely passionate about it, but they're the person, the only person who's like that. And everyone else is like, I have no idea. I don't care. Really. I don't care. Mm -hmm. And so then I've seen in the past people literally, um, commit millions of pounds to their passion, mm. which has no grounding in reality mm. and, and waste all that money on mm -hmm. it. Uh, and then eventually, you know, they end up being even celebrated for failing because they committed all that money and they went out, they kind of took the risk on this, right? And it's like, to me, that's like the silliest thing because that, let's say, 10 million that got, uh, you know, just thrown down the drain could have been actually utilized to create 100 successful companies using an actual insights model like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that that the actually apportions resources to the right areas, mm. and then you know when you when you realize that 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 you and I, for example, could do with million pounds what the next company could do with ten or twenty million, right? Yeah. P then then the regular quote unquote leaders start looking at that and going like, well, we don't believe it, right? And it's like, well, belief is not necessary. Well, this is about real, rational, scientific, real time, proper yeah. approach to real research, not this kind of we make something up and then you know it's like now drive everyone to be passionate about it. No, it's like we tap into people's actual passion to start off with and then yeah. build and mold that around, like actually work with it as a real yeah. thing, you know, it's which most when, leaders don't do. <laughs> it's funny when people um, ask me, you know, what's our business model with Anya? Maybe they think we're looking for investment or something. I don't know. And, and I always tell them, well, we do something that's pretty old school. It's called solving a universe, serving real customers and solving universal human need of wanting to be listened to and know what's going on around you. It works pretty well. 
Yeah, exactly. It's like there, there is an, and there's like real need in the marketplace. You tap into that real need and you don't need any of these kind of like McKinsey research papers that have kind of gone off and spoken to uh, God knows who, right? It's like the real need is real need. People speak about it like all the time. Uh, but but actually, what is um, uh, and, and there's a real need from the employees within the company, mm -hmm. and what is hugely time consuming is to tap into the minds of all the employees. So in the recent conversation with the leading managing director of a big consultancy, I posed this question to him: How do you tap into the you know, needs and, and thoughts of your employees. And his simple answer was, it's really complicated. And with design company software, that's really simple, right? Um, and so, so this is the big shift and the big improvement uh, that, that's of exponential order of impact uh, that's possible and that actually what it does also is that it reduces stress from management because it's very stressful to be telling people to do mm. something that they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, like parents know this with children. It's like, Layla, brush your teeth. She doesn't like it. Layla, you know, put your pajama on. She doesn't want it. She doesn't like it. It's like really like cumbersome, stressful, tiring, and so on. But, um, uh, working with her in a way that she wants to do it, then it's much easier, much more fun. Uh, and similarly can be done in companies. And then what you really do see is that the companies start thriving and people want to stay uh, no matter what's going on really. And I think that's beautiful what you just mentioned, like the, the wasted resources of continual forced compliance. Like when you're running the kind of model, for example, that I'm running at Anya, which is like, very purposeful people, high degree of human interpersonal respect, huge amounts of trust, uh, full transparency of the company finances, where we're going, how things are getting paid, like just this real respect to them. Then what you get is a situation where you can basically operate at minimum 100x capital efficiency to any established company that's just relying on lawyers and bankers to get to a, uh, particular, to a particular place. I mean, it's, it's astonishing to what extent a regular bank, like I remember the time when banks were still kind of marketed around as companies and institutions that were part taken in funding businesses, you mm -hmm. know, like, oh, we're always looking to, you know, bring us your business plan, you know, yeah, and we'll yeah. give you a loan and all that kind of stuff. You know, I went to a bank a couple of years ago and, you know, my company was like in a really, you know, good financial position, uh, you know, for a long time. And then at that particular year, it took a little dip down and I was just asking the bank for a simple loan. And the guy started saying to me, oh, do you have a house, you know, that you can put a like a collateral? And yeah, I was like, what do, you, what do you mean? It's like, but he was talking to me like I was some sort of a child, right? And uh, like I, was, I didn't know where he was leading the conversation to. And I said, like, I came here to take a business loan. I didn't come here to put my house up for grabs by your yeah. institution, my yeah. personal house. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, what's my personal house got to do with my business? It's like two completely separate yeah, entities. Yeah. But he was basically just, you know, prying on me thinking that I don't know the basics of the legal processes and you know, like how this is supposed to work. And, uh, uh you know, it's like, what's that all about? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so, so it, it's not, it, uh, what we're doing here is we're actually tapping into the real potential. Yeah. Real insights, real opportunities. And then when that real thing starts happening, the, the fake organizations like banks who are saying, like, put your personal house to get 20K business loan, they start going like, well, that's not possible. We don't believe it. And so it's like, of course you don't, because you are not actually never spoken. Like that same bank has never spoken to me as their customer in 15 years of me banking there. And yeah. that's not because that's a particularly bad bank. 
every single bank is like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, uh, I see where you're going. So, so in terms of the leadership then, um, how would you segue back into leadership and growth from the bank? Well, so the, the, that's complete misleadership. So what they got it from me there is just a, a, a peeved customer, right? Mm. Who, who was like, well, I'm not raising money from the bank mm. as a result. Uh, if I'm raising money, I'm going to be raising it from anyone but the bank. And I might go off and bank with another bank or even switch over to using cryptocurrency, etc. Because why do I need the bank? I was just looking to take my house. What I'm suggesting they do, and bear in mind, I worked with different banks as clients. And I know from inside that they don't really go off and ask the customers what they want. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm suggesting they do is they start leveraging software like this and go to de-risk their own investments, mm -hmm. start actually building products that people need and want, start surveying using a tool like this internally. Because mm. they're, they're like a typical bank, like let's say Barclays, RBS, like RBS is part owned by UK government uh, and their shares have dipped by 50%, five zero wow. uh, since the beginning of the year. It's astonishing. It's just basically collapsed. Mm -hmm. Okay. It collapsed in 2008. It got bailed out by the government. And then in this pandemic, it collapsed like bizarre, right? Okay. And so, but so that company employs tens of thousands of people. And that company has never asked those people who are potentially all customers of RBS and their relevant banks. They've never asked them what they really want from their bank. Mm. <laughs> never right yeah, I, th I think I, and I think this is kind of a good way to, to do, do, you, do, you, do you not see this as insanity no no but this uh, is what you said Jason because this is actually a perfect way if I had to re-encapsulate the wisdom of everything I'm saying so far like the epic of all the good ideas coming from the executive team along with a bit of help from the big four is over like now, if you look at the level of self-education that people can achieve with the internet, there are now in your company awareness of issues that will kill you or ideas for the next level of your company that are already there. Like you don't need to hire an outside consultant to tell you good ideas. You might want to help to implement them, but your people, your team already know where things are going next. So why not listen to them? It's, it, it, okay, so, so there is still... And, and, and I've realized this recently by interviewing a bunch of people, mm -hmm. uh, that the, the, the whole notion of a, like a cult of personality mm. is massive. Not just like, I, I understood this about like the Indian culture, right? The Indian culture, there's a sort of cult of personality through their kind of construct of deities and gods and so on. And, you know, uh, but actually, even in the Western culture, there's a massive cult of personality through celebrities, uh, movie stars, and uh, successful entrepreneurs. Uh, so even with some of the companies that I would say are very close to how a design company model runs, like let's say something like Tesla is a lot more designed company than something like Royal Bank of Scotland, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, but even at Tesla, there's that cult of personality. What Elon says goes, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but that cult of personality ruins companies because there is basically one person who seems to be like the, 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 who has sort of like a megaphone, okay? And when they speak, it's like 25,000 people speaking the in unison. The, fountain, the sole fountain of wisdom. Exactly. And, uh, and that's really counterproductive. It might work like really well, for example, for Tesla and related companies, it works well because Elon Musk is like first principles thinker and he's surrounded by a whole bunch of super smart designers who are actually tuned into a lot of stuff like that. So it works. But when it doesn't work and you still it's have that Pied Piper, it's like, you know, uh, and so what you have in those kind of companies, you have this one person who has been hired to save everyone else, right? Who kind of just kind of sits back and go, 
will they save us? And the answer is they won't because there's no one person who can pull a hundred thousand people corporation out of its kind of, you know, not thinking right. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be a massively collective uh, experiment, right? Yeah. And yield up and surface up all this thinking, however bad or good it is. Yeah. yeah and, and even more so in these like mid market companies, which we're often working with, you know, 50 to 200, 300 employees, where often the founder is the CEO, is the founder of the company very often. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, helping them as well, lever like, yes, they brought the company to that level, but then now helping them involve their people in generating the ideas or bringing the company to the next level, that's where we're at. And so this is the other thing about ideas, right? The ideas, most of the time, they don't cost anything to generate, mm. yeah? Or they cost so little that it's like, uh, ignore, you can ignore it, mm. how much it costs. But one of the worst things, that one of the costliest things in business that I've experienced over the last 15 years is committing and going all out on building a wrong idea. Oh, yeah. yeah I've seen <laughs> that in the past. Uh, uh, and so, and th this is where designed, this is the nation, nature of this, the word designed in design company. What designers do, they look to disprove an idea conceptually in as many ways as possible before it's committed to build. Because once it's committed to build and starts being built, then, then, the, then the cost goes up and up and up and up and up. And if that's a wrong thing that you're building, you're just plowing money into this black hole of, of badness, okay? Whereas design will very quickly surface, hey, this doesn't even make conceptual sense. I don't like it. If I don't like it, how can I start pitching it to other people and go, hey, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread? No, okay. I'm embarrassed. I'm going to improve it. And I'm going to improve it quickly and rapidly through a prototype, 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 prototype until I am 100% convinced that this is the best possible way of doing this thing that I've already validated with loads of other people that it's a good idea. And then I'm going to pitch it to others. We're going to go, that's crazy, great. And I've also got this, 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 and this other ways to improve it. And then you create, create this... Uh, upwards uh, generating, uh, you know, money maker basically. So the more ideas you generate, the better it is because it's super easy to discard them. It's just go no, 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 no. Uh, mm. But most companies still operate on this idea that one person who maybe has an MBA or whatever, they got some sort of formal qualification, they come in and they say. I shall tell it's like the you know Ten Commandments, blah blah blah. It's like yeah, this yeah. is the way forward, and everyone's just like okay, and it's like, no, it's not okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we do this thing at Anya, it works pretty well. It's just called like having diverse people. So we got people from the most elite schools in the world, we got people with no degrees, we got people with uh, some undergraduate studies, like all types, right? And at the end of the day, it's just about not these BS labels, but getting the most, di as our friend Sonia uh, would say, it's about getting that most diverse team of people that you can together, not for diversity's sake, but just because you have different missions in a company and different people with different life experiences are most suited to the di different initiatives that the company has to undertake. That's what it is. Yeah, in integral theory, Ken Wilber says, universe is made out of perspectives. More different perspectives you bring, the more holistic view on the thing, on the company you have, mm. and the more resistant actually it is to the outside world as you are able to comprehend and uh, uh, pitch and describe and, and um, explain the mm. whole company and propose it to, to other people. Uh, and more appealing it is to diverse uh, types of customers as opposed to just this particular niche that's thin and that's already actually pitched for by many, many other different companies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's then very tricky area to compete in and, and make any sort of uh, easy sort of growth and, and, and uh, prosperity going forward. So I, I think, you know, this, this is where we're heading uh, well, right now, really, and in the future. And um, 
the, the sort of stock prices and all these things are proofs, right? <laughs> uh, that 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 sort of myopic one person, the savior, comes in and saves everyone. Mm. Uh, if anything, the savior, that one person, is something like the design company software that once you put in there, it acts like a a form of it's not artificial intelligence in the sense of of it works on its own. It requires people to tap their thinking into it, but it works like an artificial intelligence as in the software is the curator and surfacer of those ideas. What I always like to say is that people are building neural nets of machines with Amium Design Company software. We're building a neural net of actual human brains. Exactly, exactly. And utilizing technology for where technology you know, does optim, optimizes and automates those things that, you know, just otherwise are wasteful, boring, nobody wants to do and so on and gets people to engage in the way that they like to. And, uh, and then it just works uh, and, and it creates what, what has always been looked after because any good leader would say like, if I come in and I have an idea of, uh, x and and i get fed by like i could cast the simple you know software like design company software into my company wait a few days and get back a top-notch idea that's going to make millions and billions as a wise leader i'll discard my idea and go with what employees tell me Mm -hmm. and watch everyone succeed because it's coming from them. Yeah, but it's also good for me. It'll make me yeah. look good. Yeah. That's it. That's basically the most rational, logical thing to do. But it doesn't happen most of the time. Makes sense. Well, uh, I think these wise, <laughs> this wise approach is a good way to, uh, to uh, basically sum up what we've been discussing today. Is there anything else you'd like to add on the topic of leadership? Uh, well, so if companies don't know how to do this we've also got a consulting arm that can bring this in on your behalf in your company and we're more than happy to put this in place for you and coach you guide you consult you mentor you on how to do this and then eventually let you just continue on your own and reap the rewards of your internal company wise thinking and uh you know prosper your company and pull it back from minus 50 percent to plus you know whatever you want it to be so yeah <laughs> makes sense well uh that was a good one i'm, I'm looking forward to, to the next one then awesome excellent Take conversation care. thank you very See much See you next time Bye bye. <laughs>